you know, if they get trend line yields, it's still a, a record crop for them. Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. Always a pleasure to visit with you about ag related topics. And today is no different because today is WASD day. Yes, indeed. We got USDA's WASD report. The numbers did come out. Want more? Sign up today for our premium content. You'll receive our reports twice a day, plus every morning, an in-depth market analysis with Eric Relf. Every afternoon, you'll receive our daily podcast with Marlon Bowling. The first month is only $1. We're going to sort out the information that USDA just released. With me, I have Matthew Cruz, the president of Comstock Investments. And Matthew, let's take a look at the WASD numbers as they came out from USDA today for the September edition. And I keep thinking back to earlier in the week, I heard several analysts say they couldn't think of any way that USDA could actually increase their corn yield over what they did last month. But I'll be darned, they found a way, didn't they? Yes, they did. Uh, hi, Marlon. So, yeah, we were at last month at 183 in the corn, and uh, I think that the trade was looking for a cut, a half a bushel cut at least, to to the the corn trade, and they they increased it. So went in the opposite direction, came in at uh, 183.6. Um, you know, they ended up offsetting uh, that partially just from changes to old crop inning stocks, and that's what was you know, maybe made you scratch your head a little bit that they're still making these adjustments to old crop so late in the game. And, uh, you know, they increased exports uh, and old crop stocks, they increased feed usage. And so I think close to like 50 million bushels there. And so um, that kind of off helped to offset the increase in production. So it's, you know, I, it makes you wonder how long they had that information. You know, I think they could have probably made some of those uh cuts six months ago and, and help a brother out here but um it also makes you think too that maybe our um our uh exports for new crop are understated as well because they're about the same they're 2.9 or 2.29 i think or uh to close to 2.3 billion bushels uh for both old crop and new crop so i think that uh you know we could kind of argue with the increase in 50 million bushels more for exports for new crop corn. Um, but yeah, the market was kind of disappointed in that. It's been kind of trading all over the place here today. Um, you know, it was down at uh, 397. It's come back a little bit, but we're still kind of down two at the moment. We're, we're you know, doing this during trading hours yet. And so we're, uh, it's not the close, but, uh, um, you know, I think it's uh, the long-term uh, track is still, you know, intact that uh, exports are improving. I think they got most of the negativity in the, in the corn yield, um, you know, but we're probably going to trade sideways here for a while, um, you know, until we get additional yield data at this point. Well, let's, uh, I'm going to go through the uh, crop production table here. We had corn yield uh, from USDA at 183.6 this month. The average trade guess was 182.5, as Matthew just alluded to. <clears throat> Last month, they were at 183. That means production is 15.186 billion bushels when the trade was guessing 15.08, so a little high there. Um, I thought it was interesting where the soybean yield was pegged at 53.2. Uh, the trade was looking for 53.3 bushels per acre, but it's the same as last month. 53.2. And Matthew, we've had several conference calls in the last few weeks talking about how soybeans seem to have hit a brick wall from dryness and heat in the last two to three weeks. That doesn't seem to be reflected here at all. Of course, I guess maybe this is as of the first of the month. What do you think? Nope. I, yeah, it's disappointing. I think a lot of people would agree with that sentiment that uh, you know, we've had a lot of dry weather here in late August and early September, and it's you know taken the, the yield off of the top. And, uh, you know, while it's still going to be a good soybean crop, maybe it's not quite as rosy as what they're projecting here. And so, um, you know, they, the, the trade did come in, shave off, you know, a tenth of, uh, or it stayed actually what, what it was last month. And, the, uh, you know, so it was pretty close to what the trade was expecting. So no major surprises there. But, uh, yeah, it, you know, it looks like uh, USDA is going to stay pretty stubborn for a while and, you know, we've seen this show before, right, where it takes until January or later to make these adjustments. So I, I you know, we're kind of hoping that every report they make one, but 
I think we should kind of expect, you know, hope, hope for the best, but playing for the worst, right? And just kind of expect that they're really not going to make any adjustments for um, the foreseeable future, or at least until after the, the crop is in the bin and maybe farmers have made some sales. And I think that's that's kind of everybody's fear is that uh, down the road, you go several months and then USDA will say, oh, sorry, we overestimated this or overestimated that. Just like they do with the jobs data, you know, they'll they'll keep making uh, readjustments several months or maybe even a year later. Um, and it kind of goofs up the marketplace when that happens. Uh, I do want to take a look here at the uh, U.S. ending stocks for 2024 and 2025. That would be the new crop. So for the year coming up, and you mentioned the fact that USDA was doing some shifting around on uh, usage data like export numbers. Did that catch you off guard or not? A, a little bit. You know, I, I think we're at the point now where they, they've had, had this data, data for quite a while and they know what, what it should be and, and, and they should have updated a while ago, uh, in my opinion. And, and But, you know, overall, the ending stocks came in at uh, uh, a little bit higher than what the average trade was looking for. But, uh, you know, no real surprises there. The A uh, little bit less than the soybeans. And they, they left, they didn't touch the wheat. They left that unchanged. But, uh, uh, I, I still think that there's an argument to uh, uh, move higher in the corn. You know, now the, the, the risk there is to the potential is to the upside there. If they can, uh, you know, we get here some more yield data behind us in October, November, December. You know, we, we shave just a bushel off. We can drop below those corn ending stocks at 2 billion bushels. And that's kind of the number the trade is looking for that. Um, when you begin to drop below that two billion bushel level, and and uh, and you can do that now with just just increasing the the corn usage fifty million bushels gets us right at that two billion. And so if they make any adjustments lower in the corn yield, you know half a bushel, one bushel, you're going to drop to one point nine billion bushels, and that's how you uh, can give us a chance to get back December corn or March corn back up to four fifty. Um, I think it, it's a little bit harder to make the argument, though, on, in the case of the soybeans. That's a very good point. Now, let's look at the world ending stocks numbers for 2024 and 2025. Of course, we're just into the new marketing year uh, here in the U.S. for uh, corn and soybeans. And on corn, USDA said 308.4 million metric tons, a little bit under what they had last month. Uh, they came down almost 2 million tons. Soybeans, 134.6. That's about the same as what they had last month, maybe just a scotch higher. Wheat stocks at 257.2. Now, that was down about 5 million tons from last month, <clears throat> and yet it didn't seem to have much of an impact on the wheat trade. When you look at it from the global perspective, um, anything really stand out? in your opinion there the thing that i look at here is corn stocks where were we at last year 308.5 and where are we pegged at for next year 308.4 so we haven't gotten any worse but well we haven't got you know any better either or any higher numbers right we're exactly the same place but yet corn has dropped a buck or more in the last year and so uh it just shows me there's not as much justification for corn to move any lower and there could be an argument argument for it to move higher, kind of similar in the case of the wheat. Um, now it's a much darker picture in the case of the soybeans again. And you know you were at 112 last year and 134, and you have this bigger Brazilian crop coming along that uh, you know the market is going to increasingly focus on here in the coming weeks. And so, uh, but just looking at the corn stocks, you know the corn is moving. Buyers are. are you know, continue to, to, to buy a lot of corn because it's cheap. And so I, I think that the, the USDA is understating the, the, the demand a little bit more um, than what we're seeing here on these charts. But uh, uh, so that, that's why we're a little bit more uh, cautiously optimistic on the corn. So explain the wheat. What happened there anyway? Because they were down sharply from a month ago and also down from a year ago, but yet higher than the average trade guess. Why did the trade think they would drop that number so much? I, I think a lot of it's a lot of the drought in the, in Ukraine and Russia, you know, that's that's where it's having the biggest impact probably on the market. And so uh, we keep hearing reports that it's worse than what the marketing is, is letting on. And so, but there's, there's still some uncertainty regarding that. All right. And uh, well, the wheat market did come out of the report and 
it seemed to sag a little bit, but it was kind of mixed with the spring wheat uh, kind of holding its own. Well, Matthew, thank you for helping to explain what we saw in the report. And I guess by and large, I guess it's kind of noteworthy that the markets kind of shrugged it off. And I guess they're perhaps looking more toward harvest results and uh, the uh, the uh, stocks report coming out at the end of this month, right? Yeah, we should get a better feeling for what uh, demand is and what the, the stocks report are. Hopefully it shows that there's a lot less, uh, you know, farm supply uh, stocks on in farmers' hands as well. That's another thing that uh, we're looking for that we need to, farmers need to get rid of the old crop. And hopefully, I know they've been moving it and getting getting rid of it here in the last month or so. Um, making space for new crop, but is it enough? You know, and so that that's something that concerns us. And we know a lot of farmers got caught holding too much of the old, old crop and, and hoping the prices would rally. And of course, you have direct ties with farming going on in Brazil. Are they planning yet or not? Or or uh, where are they now in their season? In, in the case of soybeans, not yet. It's still pretty early. They are allowed to plant in Mato Grosso, but uh, you aren't going to see the planting pick up there until probably early October, but it depends on the rain. Uh, for first crop corn in southern Brazil, they have started there, but it's it's kind of a long planting window for that. I think they're at maybe 15 to 20 percent planted in their first crop corn, but uh, they can plant that clear through December yet. So it's a it's a long planting window. All right. And generally, you expect maybe just a slight increase in acreage there this year? At least on soybeans. Yeah, I would look for a modest increase on on acreage there. Um, you know, they've averaged five point four percent over the last twenty years. I calculated it out the, the other day, um, but I think on the high end of the range, people are looking for two percent. Some people are looking for zero. Um, you know, just keeping it steady. And so I think you could you know find some middle ground and say maybe one percent increase. But you know, they planted close to one hundred fourteen million acres. Uh, last year, so it's still a 1.4 million increase at just one percent, right? So it's a, it's a lot of acres, and so, uh, but yeah, I, I think it'll be a pretty modest increase. But uh, you know, if they get trend line yields, it's still a, a record crop for them. Well, how is their Brazilian real comparing to the dollar right now? It's been weakening. Um, yeah, you know, I I don't have the exact number in front of me, but probably since January first, it's probably weakened close to 20 percent for the year. Um, you know, they're having a lot of uh, debt issues and that they're trying to resolve. It's it's mostly related to just government spending um, that they're they're needing to rein in their spending or increase their their taxes, increase their revenue. Um, probably not too dissimilar what happens in the United States, but we seem to we got a lot better banker than than they do. So we uh, we just keep increasing our 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 credit line every year. All right, Matthew, thanks again for uh, joining us and uh, sharing all the information. Good to hear from you again. That's Matthew Cruz, president of Comstock Investments. That'll do it for this episode. Thanks again for joining us. For producer Brianne Hendrickson, I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.